So I'm, I'm here tonight to, to talk about a project where we're trying to build a million arm course into a single computer. Um, and we're aiming to use this machine for brain modeling purposes. Now, um, the, the, the project comes under the name Spinnaker, which you can see at the top of this slide and every other slide, as I'm going to show tonight. Um, and Spinnaker is a, a contraction of spiking neural network architecture, so it's not quite an acronym. Um, but it's a name that, that uh, gives us a very nice logo that we can use. Uh, Spinning is a attractive sales. And, and I like to think it's the sort of sale which helps you to make rapid progress if you get the following win. <laughs> and, and that's what we're for with this project. Now, um, I've spent 30 years building computers in various shapes and forms. Um, and, and fairly recently, in the last 10 years, I've, I've become increasingly interested in um, the ultimate computer, a biological information processor inside each of our heads. And it's still an enigma. We still um, don't understand the fundamental principles of information processing inside the brain. Um, and if you look at the problems of trying to build a computer model on anything like the state of the brain, what you find fairly quickly is that it's still way beyond um, the most powerful computer you can lay your hands on today. Uh, but it's not that far ahead of where we expect to be in the fairly near future. So the best estimates of the kind of computing power you need to run a real-time brain model um, are the order of exascale, maybe a bit faster. And exascale is effectively the next major generation of supercomputers. So, so we are approaching that point where we can think about and building models at that scale. As we approach this point, because understanding the brain strikes me as, as one of the um, remaining great frontiers of science, um, my research is motivated by the two questions on this slide. Can we use the sorts of computing resources that are becoming available um, to accelerate our understanding of the brain function? Do we know enough about the brain to build models um, to explore what's happening there. And because I'm a computer engineer, I'm also interested in learning from the brain. Um, as we understand more about the brain, can we use it to solve some of the problems that um, are facing us in terms of making computers better? So we know that in the future, the technology we use to make computers is going to become less reliable as we continue to shrink the transistors um, following Moore's law. Reliability inevitably, inevitably will suffer. <coughs> and nature seems to know a lot more about how to build reliable systems with underlying components than we do as engineers. And, and of course, nature is highly parallel. So, so these are the two headline questions that motivate the research underpinning this evening's talk. Now, after spending 30 years as a sort of relatively conventional computer engineer, why am I suddenly Brains. Um, well, because they do address some of the problems we face. So brains are massively important. We each have the order of 100 billion neurons inside our head. Um, and those, brain, those neurons are massively connected with something like uh, a million billion synapses connection between neurons. Um, and there, there are all sorts of weird things to think about when you consider brains. Um, so everything you are, your entire personality, all your memories. Lots to be economically viable as computers, but of course the brain itself runs on about 20 or 25 watts. Um, so the computers are still a million times less efficient than the biology. And the key to that, um, in my mind, is in the next two points here, 
The brain is made out of fairly slow components. Nothing inside your head runs on time scales much shorter than about a millisecond. Whereas if you ask me to build a high performance computer, then what I do is I find the fastest technology I can find, and I build it with the fastest serial engine I know how to make. And then when all else fails, I go parallel because that's the bit we don't understand. Um, biology has a very different approach. It starts with very modest performance components and then applies them in, in very large systems. Um, the communication inside our heads is quite slow. The signals flow at a few meters a second, whereas chip designers frequently complain about speed of light limitations and how many contacts chip. Um, biology is very relaxed about that. Addressing the issue of unreliable technology, um, the brain is very tolerant of component failure. So why do you sit here listening to me? Um, I believe you will lose an average of about one euro a second. Um, that's the average uh, loss rate over the adult life of the human brain, about one euro a second. Um, don't panic about that, it's only 1 or 2% over the entire useful life of your brain, um, and your brain can accommodate 1 or 2% component loss very comfortably. If you start losing 20 or 30%, then you have a problem. Okay, that's, uh, you'll notice that, but 1 or 2%, uh, you will be essentially unaffected. And you know, the computer I'm using to give this presentation has millions of transistors in it, which are mission critical. Any one of those transistors fails, the presentation will be over, and I'll have to make it up some other way. Um, so we really have no idea how to build um, this kind of computing equipment that will tolerate one or two percent of the failure and keep working. So I think there are lots of interesting things to learn from the brain. Um, the big problem being that we still don't understand the fundamental principles of operation. We do know what the brain is made of. We know quite a lot about its components. Um, these neurons, brain cells, are a bit like logic gates. This is the computer engineer's view of biology. Um, they're multiple input, single output devices. Um, they tend to have more inputs than logic gates. Uh, I like to work with logic gates with two, three, or four inputs. Neurons typically have a thousand, ten thousand, sometimes a hundred thousand inputs. So there's a bit of a difference of scale there. Um, but like logic gates, they're useful across multiple scales. There are animals that get by quite well um, with a few hundred neurons. See, any animals has 300 and something neurons and um, lives, uh, apparently. Um, all the way up to humans with 10 to the 11, you find everything on that scale, everything in between. So they're a scalable component. And there's very little difference across that scale between the neurons that C. elegans has and the neurons that you have, apart from the number. Um, so we like scalability. Um, the other thing uh, that strikes me about uh, the current state of neuroscience knowledge is that the brain has a lot of structure. Um, and there's a great degree of regularity in how the neurons are composed. Uh, perhaps most um, surprising is the outer layer of the brain, which is the cortex. It's the sort of scrunched up sheet that surrounds the old parts of the brain in the middle. That has what the neuroscientists call a six layer microarchitecture. Um, so they're beginning to use computeresque words. And it's shown in the figure at the bottom of this slide. And that's a neuroscientist diagram of this six layer microarchitecture. And it looks Reasonably convincing, like a schematic. Um, it was probably a bit small for some of you. Uh, it turns out when you go and inspect it very closely, that all the detail you'd expect to find in the schematic is missing um, because it's not there. Um, but there is regularity of structure there. And the thing that I find intriguing is that the, the six layer microarchitecture is pretty similar at the back of the head where it's performing functions such as lower image processing, edge detection, and so on, which we sort of understand. And at the front of the head, where it's doing things such as higher level thought and natural language processing, where we really have knowledge of the clue. It's not enough. And yet these processes run 
on the same basic fabric, which suggests very strongly to me that there will be algorithmic similarities when we do understand this, because the fabric is the, the algorithm is embedded in the fabric, there isn't anything abstract like a program running on it. Um, the algorithm is all embedded in the hardware, so the hardware looks similar, and the algorithm is pretty much bound to be similar. But you didn't come to learn about biology if you're a programming interest group, so I don't think you want to see the world that's a bit more confusing. Um, the research that we're undertaking is, is focused around building a machine, being computer engineers, faced with the challenges of understanding the brain, we'd like to contribute by building a machine um, that's as generic as possible, um, and then see if our psychology and neuroscience colleagues can do something useful with it to pursue their scientific goals. And the project is set up to try and build a million mobile phone processors, a million on cores, into a single computer. Again, just to reinforce the scale of the problem, with a million ARM processors, we can get to about 1% of the complexity of the human brain using very simplified models of neurons. So we abstract most of the biological detail away, but try and retain the full network complexity. And even with those simplifications, with a million processors, we only get to about 1% of the brain. So the obvious question is, why stop at a million? Um, and the answer is, this is an academic research project. That's probably where we run out of money. <laughs> so, uh, and on the other hand, it's only 1% of the human brain, but it's 10 whole mice. So it's, uh, it's quite useful on biological scales. Now, to build this machine, um, what we wanted to do was produce something that was as generic as possible in terms of which bits of the brain our collaborators might want to model. Um, I've mentioned the cortex, but the microarchitecture of the cerebellum which is um, a substantial piece of the, the older brain, where we learn most of our physical skills, so that's where you learn to ride bikes and play the piano, is, is by programming your cerebellum. That has a completely different microarchitecture um, from the cortex. So if you want to cover that as well, um, we have to adopt some principles to make the machine flexible. And being computer engineers, of course, what we do is we try and virtualize things. Um, so they're as flexible as possible. So Spinnaker is based on what we call a virtualized topology. Um, the machine itself has a 2D mesh structure. The models that run on the machine can have a completely different um, topology. And in principle, if you have a, a neural network that you want to model, you can throw any neural onto any processor in the machine, and we will connect them together in biological real time. Um, so we virtualize the connectivity. Um, in practice, if you throw them onto a machine in a fairly sensible way, that will make our job of the them much easier. <laughs> but the, uh, the principle is there. Secondly, um, bounded asynchrony. Um, the, the thing that makes large-scale parallel programs um, difficult and, and generally or often inefficient um, is, is if you need to make synchronizations across the whole machine. So on Spinnaker, we don't. Uh, Spinnaker basically has no synchronization mechanism at all. Um, all the processors run in their own little world, um, modeling real time locally. And because they all have the same idea of real time, they stay in step. Um, but they have to cope with receiving messages when they arrive, and they send messages when they feel like it. Um, and, and nothing in the machine tries to synchronize anything. This does mean the machine has some interesting um, non-deterministic properties. And so we can't guarantee if you run the same problem twice, you get exactly the same answer, uh, which seems to offend some of my purest science colleagues a bit. Um, but it seems entirely practical. It's an experimental instrument. If you, run, if you measure things in a lab twice, you get slightly different answers. Um, I don't see why simulations should be on the um, and the third principle um, is more computer engineering, which is energy frugality. Um, my observation in today's world is that um, essentially processes are free. Um, the cost of designing an arm into a mobile phone is now a few cents. Um, they are free. Um, 
what you really want to worry about in the computation is the amount of energy required to complete the computation in the time. And therefore, the machine is not optimized to make efficient use of all the processes. It assumes they're free. It doesn't matter if they're busy or not. What matters is, is the cumulative energy consumption um, to complete the job. So what the machine looks like, um, there, there's a rather simpler picture of the two-dimensional mesh. Um, we like the double picture because it looks interesting. I think it's just a 2 d mesh with periodic boundaries. Um, we have a two-dimensional array of processing nodes where each node contains two chips. One is the spinning chip we've designed ourselves, and the second is the standard memory chip. And these are connected um, in two dimensions with sort of X and Y and one diagonal but not the other. Or if you skew this picture of this, it's a regular triangle um, and, and again, Y two dimensional. Um, clearly, you can get more bandwidth by going into more dimensions, but then designing the machine becomes a lot harder. And it turns out that two dimensions is entirely adequate to this problem. So there's no real advantage in, in making the machine any harder by going into more dimensions. The load of the machine um, is uh, shown in this slide. It's basically a conventional um, many core chip. So uh, the row across the middle, a little bit small where you are, is just a row of processors. There are 18 on the chip. Again, why is it 18? Well, that's just how many fit in a sensible size chip. Originally, the plan was to have 20. It turned out we couldn't quite squeeze the 20 in, uh, so it became 18. And they are just symmetrically arranged. They have access to shared memory at the bottom, which is only shared as an implementation of convenience. Logically, they should each have their own memory, but that's um, difficult to implement. And the key innovation in the machine is the communications uh, architecture which occupies the top part of this picture. Um, the problem with modeling large systems of spiking neurons um, is the communication, the very high connectivity. And in Spinnaker, um, we've adopted an idea from earlier neuromorphic chips which use a a spike <coughs> representation called address event representation, AER, where when a neuron spikes, you simply broadcast the identity of that neuron. You give each neuron a number, you broadcast the number, and then all the neurons to which it connects pick that number up and process it appropriately. We've taken that idea, um, but broadcast is, of course, not a scalable principle, and so we've mapped that into a packet switch fabric. So the machine is based on a lightweight <coughs> packet switch fabric. Every chip has a router on. And when a processor that is modeling a neuron issues a spike from that neuron, it simply drops a packet into the fabric with that neuron identity in. It has no idea where that packet is going. Fabric routes it uh, to all the necessary destinations, which may be thousands or hundreds of thousands of destinations. I'm going to say more about the communication a little bit, but that, if you like, in terms of machine architecture, is the key idea. Uh, all, generally, all software types here to learn about programming, I'll get that shortly. Um, but with, with the physical manifestation of this machine, uh, that's what an 18 core chip looks like. Um, each of the rectangles with the dark bits and lighter bits um, is a 968 core. Peripherals in there, um, and the dark bits, in fact, which dominate are, are simply the memory. So, um, in this application, the memory is highly localized. In typical distance data moves while it's being processed in one or two millimeters. And that's one of the keys to energy efficiency. Um, the access to the DRAM is, is over several millimeters, but that's much less frequent. And in fact, we've, made, we've minimized that. By, as shown in the top left picture, we folded the DRAM into the same package. So uh, we have the spinning chip um, on the substrate with the DRAM literally glued on top, um, wired on together, and then packaged in a single square package. So I have one physical exhibit, which I really forgot about, which 
That is what the package looks like. Reminiscent of a quarter of an after-eight minute. <laughs> it's about a millimeter thick, and in there there's a printed circuit on a substrate, two microchips, gold wire bonding, or lots of plastic. Um, sorry? Sorry? Yes, uh, the, 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 on the back of the package you can see 300 forms, as they're called, um, and they form the connections to the circuit or facilities. 300 for grid array. With the attractive sail logo on the top. <laughs> and an equally attractive R logo, although I'm told this is wrong, so it, it will be changed. <laughs> <coughs> to satisfy R is the um, We assemble these devices. Um, we can basically tile the world with these packages now, and they connect directly to each other. Um, so the current state of the, of the project is we have a circuit board with four gates of these nodes on that's 864 ARM processors on this PCB and uh, the complete board uh, consumes between about 20 and 50 watts depending on how hard it's working. Um, so you get a thousand processors for 30 or 40 watts. Um, and we are now using this board as the basic component to scale up to larger machines. Uh, currently, the board has been used in robot platforms. So the robot on the left is developed by high at the Technical University of Munich. Um, and they can power this thousand processor board on the back of their robot um, from onboard batteries, and it will run for a couple of hours on those batteries. Uh, and we're beginning to assemble machines in, uh, in car frames and racks, as shown on the right hand side of the picture. And our goal um, is to build a series of machines which are imaginatively called the 103, 104, 105, and 106 machine, where the notation is that the 103 machine has approximately 10 to the 3 processors, the 104, 10 to the 4, and so on. Um, so the 103 is basically one of those 48 node cars, the 104 is a dozen of them in a small frame, the 105 is a machine room cabinet with 120 volts in, and the 106 is 10 of those cabinets, um, beginning to occupy quite a lot of machine room and at a peak of about 90 kilowatts, um, requiring a bit of cooling to keep it down. So that's the hardware story. Um, the key component of the architecture is the way we do the internet. And this is to emulate the very high connectivity of the biological system. Um, we wanted a single mechanism uh, to do all this delivery. And what we do is we map each neural spike into a packet. And then in the machine, um, our goal is to guarantee the delivery of that packet to everywhere it needs to go, which may be many places, um, in a time well under a millisecond. And that ensures that we sustain biological real time. Now, we do have a number of packet types in the machine for system management purposes, uh, but the key packet for the neural modeling is the multicast packet. Um, and this is conveyed through by hardware through the fabric. Um, and if you're interested in statistics, packets cross roughly. Uh, five nodes per microsecond. So if we have a machine that's 100 by 100 nodes, um, then it's about 20 microseconds uh, from one port to the other. So we are well under the millisecond target provided for this question. And the packets are the unusual feature. Um, the packet is just an event ID which identifies the neural on the spikes. And that's 32 bits with 8 bits of um, management information attached on the front. Um, so the big packet is 40 bits. Uh, all Spinnaker packets have an optional 32 bit payload that can be tagged on the end. So packets are either 40 or 72 bits. But most neural spike packets are simply 40 bits. And that's what the machine is very good at it's handling very large numbers of very small packets. Um, now, to get these packets to the right place, each chip contains a router. And in principle, it sounds like you need a table with 
two to the 32 or 4 billion entries. Um, now, even with the current state of dealers like technology, that's uh, an expensive thing to implement. And so, uh, the optimization that we use on Spinnaker is we don't have a big table, um, we use an associated lookup table. And the associated lookup is based on a three state lookup so that you can have no cares. Um, so, it's a turn that we can. And this allows us to implement rules stuff on each chip, which has 1,024 rather than 4 billion entries. Um, 1,024 is a slightly finger in the air number. Okay. So, I can easily design a network with pathological properties that breaks this routing table. No real network that anybody's tried to map yet uses even 10% of the table. So, the table size is right on some scale. Um, the optimizations are firstly the, the ternary lookup, and, and neural networks typically are modeled as populations rather than individual neurons, so population here connects to a population there, a population there, and we can make those connections with just a single table entry for complete population using the don't care feature in fairly obvious way. Furthermore, the router has a default mechanism. If the event lookup has no match in the table, then the packet takes the default route, which is to pass straight through a particular node. Um, so if you think of a simple point-to-point -point connection, uh, you need a table entry <coughs> to the source of the packet, you need one table entry to the turning point on the route, and you need one table entry to the destination. So you can get from anywhere to anywhere with three table entries. Of course, with multicast, you usually have a tree structure, and uh, that requires more entries. <coughs> but this is basically the key idea um, in the way Spinnaker does its routing. CAM is a content addressable memory class, and the MC stands for multicast. <laughs> so, if we want to map a problem onto the machine, um, then what we have to think about is what the topology of the problem is. So um, the arbitrary graph on the left of this picture um, shows a set of neural populations that we want to connect to each other um, following the arcs as illustrated in the picture. And we then need some mechanism for mapping those populations onto individual processes. And then the arcs are used to construct the routing tables. And this particular graph and can be mapped onto uh, three of the six processes in the network shown on the right uh, with just three routing table entries at each point, and that constructs the topology of that problem. The general problem mapping is rather different from the conventional line performance computer um, because what we do right at the front end is we split the problem into two components. We split the problem into the topology graph which describes how the components of the problem link to each other. And that's the top part of the picture, which is used to set up all the routing of the machine. And then the functionality of each node, which is programmed more conventionally and compiled along the bottom and loaded as code into the individual processes. So we map the problem onto the machine um, as the first stage in executing it, and then we load it onto the machine and then run it. And of course, what this is assuming is that the topology of the problem is either fixed in most cases or, or worse, slowly changing. So, this is not a completely general purpose solution to building arbitrary dynamic graphs in a machine. It assumes that, like the biology, the topology of the problem is fixed or at least or at most slowly changing. When we put the machine together with the million processes, um, high-performance computers both like to talk about bisection performance, uh, take an axe and chop the machine to two parts and see how much communication you have connecting the parts. And on Spinnaker, if you do that, um, you can work out that we can move about 10 billion packets a second between the two parts of the machine. Um, and that's enough for a very pathological network where every neuron in one part of the machine connects to at least one target in the other part of the machine. 
real biological systems have far better locality than that. Um, and therefore, the bisection performance with the two dimensional interconnect uh, is more than sufficient for the problem. Now, those who like to think about their problems um, in rather more formal ways, um, we do have a description of the way we think about the models that we execute, and, and we call this um, partially ordered event-driven systems. Um, the execution model, which I'll come on to next, is going to be, it's very much event-driven. So the base state of the processor is idle, um, in fact halted, and using uh, as little power as possible. Um, so we think of the, of the system as being composed of a set of dynamical processes, um, each of which has a state that's evolved naturally over time, and these are coupled through a set of event channels. Where if you think of neurons, you can think of spikes propagating along axons, and each spike is a pure event in the biological neural system. And therefore, each event channel effectively carries a time series of pure asynchronous impulses. And process can generate these events and transmit them along event channels to other processes. The biological model, uh, the, the, the biology of the brain, we think is captured um, by this in a hybrid model, um, hybrid in the sense that the processes evolve in continuous time um, and the communication happens as discrete asynchronous events. If we want to build a computer model of that, then we can't <coughs> accurately capture continuous time. We have to discretize time as well. So the spinnaker we think of is executing a discrete approximation for the hybrid model. <coughs> and then we abstract time um, into a series of events, typically at one millisecond intervals. Um, one millisecond is, is a time step used by quite a lot of computational neuroscientists. Uh, of course, it, it's programmable in the machine, but that's the default to the number. Um, and then we can think of the machines being purely event-driven, effectively time is being abstracted into these discrete events, and the whole thing is then just a discrete event-driven model. Now, in practice, the processing of each event on spinning it takes a finite time, and therefore you get um, the hazard that events will overlap, you will be processing one event when another event happens. And, and then you're into uh, the usual practical programming problems of having to have a real time operating system with, with job to do and, and priorities and schedules and so on. Um, but I think thinking of what we're trying to do in terms of these three layers of model, there's a pure hybrid model that represents the biology at the level of neural spikes and, and I don't know if there are biologists in the audience, but I'm, I'm perfectly aware that the spikes are the whole story when it comes to your communication exchange, but they're a large part of the real time story. Um, so the hybrid model captures that. You can think of the discrete model where each event is, is, is processed atomically, and then you can think of the real world where event handling starts overlapping and interfering, and then we need um, some more computer science underpinnings to make the compute the same answer. So the execution model is event driven and on a typical processor um, there are three events that uh, dominate what it gets up to. Uh, as I've said, it uh, sits in, in what I'm called a wait for interrupt state, so it's halted, um, no internal clocks, and it's just simply waiting until the event happens to wake it up. And there are three events that it handles. Um, first is an incoming packet event. So a spike arrives from somewhere else in the machine. It then wakes up. It has to find the data structures that it needs to process that spike. And these are the data structures that we push out onto the local SD RAM chip. And so we don't wait for them to arrive, we initiate a DMA transfer, direct memory access transfer, um, and that. And then the processor immediately goes back to sleep, waiting for the DMA to complete. The DMA completes, generating a second class of event, at which point the processor wakes up. 
um, processes all the sign-ups data, updating the states of all the neurons into modeling them locally, um, and we model hundreds to a thousand neurons on, on each processor, and that causes updates to happen. Then the process goes back to sleep. And the third event, which is completely independent of the other two, is the timer tick, where every millisecond the processor wakes up, runs the neuron models, which is typically a simple Euler differential equation solver, um, in the course of which some of the neurons may issue spikes and lackeys go out, um, and then it goes back to sleep. So there are these three key events um, in practice, if the machines being used reasonably efficiently, these events will overlap and require some scheduling. And so um, underpinning the software model, um, there is a very simple um, API, and underpinning the API is a very simple um, real-time operating system. And uh, the real-time operating system uh, recognizes two classes of, of events. There are queuable events and the non queuable events that the process instantly. And then the event queue is handled um, in priority order. Uh, things are wound down off it. And hopefully, in every millisecond time step, the processor completes the set of work to be done and goes back to sleep. Uh, but during that millisecond, you can get quite a, a little backlog of things to get on with. Now, that's the basic programming model. Um, the, the machine has an infrastructure to support this. So I've shown you the chip with 18 processors on. Um, when the machine starts up, all those processors run through a built-in self-test. Those that pass the test volunteer to be monitor processor, and one of them is chosen to act as monitor processor on the chip. The monitor processor effectively runs an operating system which supervises what the other processors are doing. But 16 other processors are then appointed to execute the application, and they are the ones that are running this, this, this simple code, uh, the real time code that I've been describing here. Um, those of you who follow the high performance computing business might recognize this model. Um, the IBM Blue Gene Q uh, coincidentally it has a chip with 18 processors in, one of which runs the operating system, 16 on the application, and one is a one of spare. Um, that's exactly the model that we decided on spinning it before the vision of the UK. Um, we're not accusing that here. No, it is striking me, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, at the low level, this, this is a, this is, it's a detailed, real-time system. Um, we don't generally expect our psychology and computational neuroscience colleagues to really want to get their hands dirty writing real-time long code. Um, and so what we try and do is provide layers of software that, that abstract um, what's happening on the machine in real time. And we've done this uh, for a couple of standard models out there. Um, one European standard is PINE, and PINE stands for Python Neural Networks, I believe. Um, this allows the neuroscientists describe the networks they're interested in modeling at the level of populations and projections and what the dynamics of the neurons are and what the dynamics of the synapse are. Um, and they write this all at a very high level. And then Pine back, back, back ends onto a number of simulators. Um, so there are half a dozen software simulators out there that will execute the Pine model. Um, and what we've done with Spinnaker is we've implemented a design flow that maps this Pine model onto Spinnaker. So in principle, if you're, if you're a neuroscientist and you have a fine model uh, that works for a standard simulator, um, we can map it on the screen for a day and will operate um, much faster in biological real time. And, and this follows the principle that I outlined earlier of separating the problem from the function of topology, mapping the topology into the screen of the hardware, um, and mapping the functions through C code onto the processes. We have a library of um, the neural models, so you need to use neural models that are in our library or random models. When you do this, you can extract data from the machine to see what it's doing, and it produces graphs like the one on this slide, um, which 
I usually describe as looking like pretty much every computer, every, every computer, every neuroscience panel you've ever seen. Um, the, of course, the interesting stuff is in the detail. We need to go into the machine basically generates the kind of results you'd expect, um, but by using this, this, this parallel um, mechanism, it does it in real time, and therefore you can use these networks in robot controls and the like. One of the intriguing issues with, with neural networks is how on earth do you know any of this is right? I mean, how, do you, how do you know this is calculated? Anything like that? Um, and that's a hard question. You can, you can answer it at a, quite a low level by looking at the um, details of the outputs from the models. So we, we have models for leaky integrated fire neurons and, I, and for ECK pictures, bifurcating dynamic system models, um, and we can compute the membrane potentials and we can compare them with simulators that we trust. Um, you know, and low, they look pretty similar. One of the details I, I haven't mentioned is that Spinnaker is entirely fixed point. So the, the, the arm cores we use are quite simple and they're fixed point frequency. Um, whereas most of the reference models are close to point. Um, so you'd expect some very high order deviation. Um, so basically we can, we can track pretty closely. And that's okay at the very low level. Um, as you get to large systems, a lot of neural networks intrinsically have chaotic behavior. In other words, no two simulators will produce identical outputs. Um, they diverge with smallest perturbations. And so you can look at the red and the blue spots in this picture, which is a conventional raster plot, time runs horizontally. The, the uh, 500, what we have, my glasses. Yeah, the 500 neurons in the system are represented by the vertical axis, and every time one of the neurons spikes, you put a dot in the picture. So basically, you're seeing spiking patterns, and overlaid in this picture are the spiking patterns computed by Spinnaker in blue, and the spiking patterns computed by a different simulator called Nest, which is fairly well accepted, and the software simulator, and they're in red. And your challenge is to decide whether the red spots and the blue spots are, in some sense, doing the same thing. Um, this is quite hard, except this particular benchmark has a characteristic which is well known, which is the overall activity of the, of the uh, network increases in steps. And so the plot at the bottom right uh, shows the cumulative activity of the two models. And you can see what you probably have modular of the obvious noise and the results uh, that the two simulations are doing the same thing in terms of following the steps. So you might believe that. Um, what you can do at a higher level um, is plug the network into some kind of real-time physical system we're looking at it does. So this is um, a silicon retina from Seville which generates, it's, it's, it's like a camera, like a webcam, except instead of producing frame-based output, it produces spike-based output. Whenever the luminance of a pixel changes by more than a certain amount, you get a spike out. So it's, it's fairly similar to the biological retina. And you can feed the output of that retina into networks on Spinnaker, which are modeling the early vision processing in the brain. It's a fairly simplified way. And on the right-hand side of this video, you can see the image which has been shown to the silicon retina, and on the left hand side, you can see responses from models of orientation selected bits of V2, which is the brain region, and you can see that they are responding to the inputs in a way that you would broadly recognize as sensible. Um, so that's testing the network at a high level to see if this behavior works. The, the problems of testing neural networks were, were underlined to me a few years ago when I had a student who was in a project of neural networks. Um, and uh, this project appeared to be working, but not very well. Um, and on closer inspection, it turned out that there was a matrix of connections where due to a minor coding error, uh, the code was only ever looking at the leading diagonal. 
this matrix. So it was using about 0.1% of the data it was supposed to be on. Yet it was still working. Um, so this is, this is one of the hazards. These things can work uh, for reasons that we don't necessarily understand. Um, because they're quite redundant or tolerant points. Therefore, um, they're much more robust than you might expect. So this system was put together at a workshop in Capacaccia in Sardinia, where several of my research groups suffer in nice weather every year, <laughs> next to the coast in Sardinia. But I'm told they spend all day in these hot rooms building systems and making them work and enjoy themselves as well. They're just coming back today from this year's episode. Um, another example of a, a high-level model. Um, this one, instead of using Pi, this one uses Nengo as its source. Uh, Nengo being a tool developed by a group at the University of Waterloo. Um, this, again, you can see from the back. Um, this is quite a sophisticated neural network, which is modeling the basal ganglia in the brain which does action selection, it's, it's the brain that decides if you're hungry, um, but you're also tired, whether you eat or sleep, okay, it's a kind of central arbiter, um, and that's controlled by the slider on the right of the group of four, and that is telling the mouse whether it prefers to go home or find cheese. Um, inside the model, there are phase-encoded um, hippocampal place cells, uh, which the mouse uses, or the rat, I think they call it, um, the rat uses to work out where it is. It integrates the velocities, computer's position, and, and these are modeled again on biology. So, basically, only some rhythms you can see uh, represent how that part of the brain is understood to work. And you can see the rat detecting when it's near home. Um, it's, it's about the most interesting neural network we built, with about the most boring external behavior. So, <laughs> So what we see the robot doing is going from A to B and then back to A. Um, what we have to understand is that the, the neurobiology that's controlling this is really quite a sophisticated and detailed model of, of, of how the animal achieves the same feat. Except the robot's blind. Um, this particular robot is doing everything by integrating the losses to determine the position. So we've got various systems running. Um, the kind of thing I'd like to do in the next year um, is again based on the Waterloo system. Um, Crystal Eisner at the Waterloo uh, had a paper published in Science two or three months ago uh, on his spawn model. Um, I don't know if it's supposed to sound like weird science fiction. Um, but spawn is, is quite a detailed model based on several brain areas, um, which is a single neural network that displays a whole range of different behaviors depending on what it sees. So it has a vision input system, it has a robot out or output system, and it's shown a sequence of characters which it uh, takes the first character or a particular code uh, as an instruction to follow a certain behavior. So you can show it a sequence of digits and can predict the next digit in sequence, or you can show it a handwritten number and it can copy the style of handwriting. Okay, so it, it, it has eight. Um, currently eight different behaviors built into it um, and is by far the most sophisticated um, cognitive neural network that's, that's been developed to date. Um, and one of my plans for next year, currently it's the spawn model takes several hours of computing for each second real time. Um, and I'm confident that when we have about two card frames, oops, two card frames full of screen cards, and we can run a small model in real time. And that will be quite exciting. That's my next big objective. Um, so it's just about 7 o'clock. I'd, I'd better wrap up. Um, I think um, the kind of message I want to get over is that, is that, is that brain modeling is a very significant computational challenge. And the machines are now getting to the point where it's not silly to think about being achievable. Um, if not now, then within a few years. Um, Spinning is a machine that's been tuned to this problem. Um, and by tuning the architectures of the problem, we can actually get a step ahead. So, the kind of models we can run in real time, you can't run on a high end supercomputer in real time uh, because the communications architecture on high end is too heavyweight. You've 
of the economic practice around the community. Um, the major innovation in the machine is how we do communications, and we've got working hardware software, we have small ones running, um, and, and those are going to scale up into the big machine over the next year. And the, the graphic on the right hand side of this slide uh, also has some interesting messages, and you can't read the numbers up here. Um, but um, it's a, a graphic that's been produced as part of the Human Brain Project proposal, um, which is the EU the billion euro EU ICT flagship project to um, try and advance models and understanding of the brain. Um, and on this scale, it shows you the energy for synaptic events, so the energy consumed by spike crossing synapse from one neural to the next. And the biology at the bottom of this graph uh, can convey synaptic events in about 10 to the minus 14 joules. Analog neural models, um, the best ones around are about 10 to the minus 10 joules, that's four of the magnitude up. The spinning is about 10 to the minus 8 joules, that's two of the magnitude. Um, standard cluster machines are about 10 to the minus 4 joules, uh, and detailed biological models running on an IBM Bougie cube are about 10 to the minus 0 joules. So this, this is a scale with 14 orders of magnitude uh, between the top and the bottom. Um, we are nowhere near the electronics that we peak in biology yet. Um, but the, the interesting levels are sort of some, some, somewhere towards the bottom where spinning is about the best you can do digitally at the moment. And you can do better with analog circuits, uh, but then you lose a lot of flexibility that we can build into the digital models. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. I don't know how you usually do this. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell a little bit more about uh, how packets are processed? Are they queued somewhere in the memory? No. <coughs> and what are the uh, <coughs> request primitives uh, together? What are they, the primitives? Okay, um, so the communications fabric, um, I'll stand in the microphone. The communications fabric um, does not involve any processes from the point that the first processor puts the packet into the fabric, the point where it arrives at the destination and interrupts the target processor. No processes are involved between those two endpoints. Um, the fabric itself, is a self-timed fabric, so it's, it's, it's clock-free, um, but it does effectively behave like a pipe bone. Okay, so the packets form cubes. Um, the routers themselves are little pipelines, clock engines, uh, and again, so there's some cube. Um, but there's no significant buffering anywhere. So um, the fabric breaks most of the rules high performance computer communication fabrics for yeah. usually, usually the rule is thou shalt not have any loops. They're not points. Our fabric is full of loops. Um, the reason we get away with this is because if you look at the statistics of, of the model, our fabric is very lightly loaded. So to achieve the real-time delivery across large machines, um, we generally expect the fabric uh, utilization to be below 10% of capacity. When it's below 10% um, you only get statistical congestion, it clears very quickly. If all else fails, we drop packets. If, all else, if, if, if the packet can't progress after a certain time, it's just thrown on the floor. Um, and that's not so unreasonable in the context of neural systems. Lots of spikes get lost in your brain. So you get that. Transmitted reliably. Uh, Synapse is an unreliable company. Um, but we do consider dropping packets to be effectively a loss of performance. And so, in typical models, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. But you can learn how to resolve. Um, the interface, at the hardware level, each processor has a local communications controller, which is just a glorified few marks that you can build that in, basically, the set of registers. And you put the, um, the send spike packet, you drop those two bits into a register, and it goes off. Um, when it arrives, you get an interrupt that wakes you up and you go look in that register and that tells you where the spikes come from. That's at the hardware level. 
Um, the API that we have raises the abstraction on that so that um, you can effectively um, tell, uh, tell the, um, the operating system that if this event happens for this piece of code, and, and then the values are passed in a fairly simple way, quite low level way. In the, the machine is deliberately designed to have these kind of things work at a very low level because if you look at the budget, you know, we have about 20 to 30 clock cycles to process the snapshot today. That's not a lot of work. 20 or 30 odd instructions. Um, we have uh, a budget of a few tens of instructions to do the Euler equation solver of the, the new one. So it's quite tightly defined at the bottom. Does that, that answer your question? Or, no, but then how are processors and the core gets uh, interaction and then uh, it's up to the core how to handle it or what? Yes. Yes, so the core will, will have had um, some code connected to that event, the input to the event, and you can attach handlers to events. Okay. So when that event happens, the handler is invoked, and the handler knows to go pick up the packet from the communications controller, and it knows how to process it. And if there is no packet and the record has nothing to do with that, you have to say, just wait. Yes, wait for input. But it's not waiting uh, for the packet and then just indifferent. No, 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 it's, it's, it, it, you know, we don't do cold loops. Cold loops are very bad in energy sensitive systems. Um, but the, the, the halt and wait for interrupt model basically minimizes the energy consumption. The process just gets woken work, up effectively on the clock. It's the wake up time is 5 nanoseconds, it's 200 megabytes of clock. Um, and immediately it's in the interrupt code. So once like the event tree system is found uh, in the scene, then we will able to define now that the which the part is called. And it is then uh, in mechanism to be found in the scene. Just to confirm the values of that scene. Um, so the, this is a fairly complicated question. Um, I may not think it is, but uh, um, yeah, so, so each processor effectively has a local time account. So that just <coughs> that counts the passage of time, and that is responsible for generating the millisecond interrupts. Um, but the, um, the, the, um, the routers on the chip um, effectively have programmable timeouts for when they decide to drop the packet because they've waited too long. They actually have, before they do the packet drop, they have an emergency routing or tolerance mechanism that tries to send the packet a different way. Okay, so if, if, if the primary output channel is blocked, after a certain time, the router then tries to send it a different way to the destination. If that route is also blocked after a certain time, it drops, and those times are all configurable. Um, so you can configure them to be infinite, then that can block the drops, but if you get wrong with the deadlock, um, the machine will not progress ever again until so you reset it. So um, the pattern of asynchrony is it's simply saying that we don't lock things together in a strict sense, but every processor knows how fast time is passing and those measures of time passing will track fairly um, So it's done by local dead reckoning rather than by global time signals. Um, <clears throat> no, the brain, the brain is essentially intrinsically clockless. But it does have asynchronous circuits that generate rhythms. And those rhythms um, play some of the role of clock. So I talked about the yeah. yeah. So I talked about uh, hippocampal phase encoding, hippocampal play, uh, play styles in the hippocampus. There's a theta rhythm, um, which is a few hertz, I think it's about eight hertz. Um, and, and it looks like a sinusoid activity. And the position of the rat relative to some place it understands um, is indicated by the firing of a particular place cell. But where it is relative to that place, it's encoded by the phase of that firing of the sinusoid. But there isn't a, you know, there's no external sinusoid or signal generator. It's, it's, a, it's a spontaneous inversion of um, from the way the neurons are composed in that region of the brain. And there are other, other rhythms in other regions. 
and some some regions are not going to be. Yeah, so we need to say a little about the model. You're saying the states are yeah. What what challenges do you have come to the So um, we know quite a lot about individual neurons. Uh, the, the, and there's a whole range of mathematical models of neurons from uh, the very detailed Hodgkin Huxley Ralph Abel equation, multi compartmental, which are very complex to compute, um, but which are generally believed getting fairly close to biological fidelity, um, up to, uh, I mentioned leaky integrated fire, um, which are, are, are in the class of point neural models very effectively, all, all the spatial complexity of the neural is ignored. Think of this as operating at a single point in space, and the inputs effectively drive a leaky integrator, and if that exceeds a threshold, then you get an average um, And there's a whole range of models in between. Um, and, and Spinnaker is, is, is is, is most optimized for models at the simpler end of point building models. Um, but the real problem if you want to build a mass brain model is to get the connectivity pattern, what's called the connecto. Because um, we're quite a long way from knowing that the circuit diagram of the mass brain, um, which is what you need to build a complete model. So if you, if you wanted to construct such a model now, you would have to rely on <coughs> Um, statistical estimates of how particular populations of neurons connect to others, you wouldn't be able to get a precise connectivity, but there's quite a lot of statistical data on, on average neurons of this type connect to about this many neurons of that type within this kind of radius Gaussian distribution. And you can use those statistics to construct a synthetic connection map, which may or may not be right. <laughs> but it, 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 and the information in that space is, is growing very rapidly now. I mean, the, 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 uh, it has been the next own project in the States. We're now scanning devices which can actually read out all the major uh, connection channels um, and be visualized and read out. Um, the fine level details are, and in particular, we, uh, the models give each connection a kind of strength. This is a weak side lens, that's a strong side lens. Um, we're a very long way from being able to measure the strength of every side lens in the mouse brain, let alone the human brain. So those all have to be guessed, again, from statistics. We'll take a question over here. So what do you think of the two things in a model? It's software. You don't be like it. Yeah, so you can have feedback. Yes, <coughs> most, most of the models that computational neuroscientists use um, don't do that. Um, in fact, if you look at the problem of computing brain models, it's not the neurons that take the compute cycles, it's the synapses. And um, just as there are many different levels of detail and complexity in neural models, the same is true of synapses. Um, and, there's a, the, 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 and, and it's much less clear as to what's right in that space. Um, so you come across models, I mean, the, the, the general synaptic understanding goes back to Donald Head in the 1960s, I think, about where he speculated that the ones that fire together and wire together, so way of correlated activity, connection strength grows. Um, but there are all sorts of flavors of that now. Um, and, and, and there are spike time independent plasticity, um, extends the correlation model to include the causality. Okay? So, not enough of the neurons to fire at the same time. This one has to fire before that one, if it goes that way, it's, it's a causal relationship. Um, it's far from clear how true it is, how, how well supported these models are. So people play with the level of models. So which ones do you compute your um, models in the world? 
Sorry? Um, so the topology is basically defined, if you've written a pi model or an endo model, you specify the topology. Perhaps, yes, yes. And so when, as, as you wrap it onto the machine, you start with populations and projections, where a projection is, you know, this one with your ones, connects to that one with your ones, with about 10% of the possibility of the Gaussian space distribution. Uh, generally statistical descriptions of what happens. Um, if the model you want to run, you don't want to put a hundred on a single processor, then, then there's a stage which, which splits the populations into part populations and projections into part projections. So you go to that program. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so you, you, you have a set of constraints to what the machine can handle, and, and you match the model against the constraints, and, and, and effectively, um, detailed graph, so split nodes into multiple nodes and arcs into multiple arcs, and multiple arcs but, um, under, under control of these constraints, and then map the resulting graph onto the machine. You don't have to get a management system for all sides, so you don't have to get a problem with all sides. And so, it, do we have it? No. Is it possible in principle? Yes. But we, we, have, we have not done any. Any models that change hardware, to change at that level. It's fairly easy to make local changes. It's far, rather harder to make changes that affect the packages. But it's possible, we believe. Yeah. We certainly have proved that it's possible to do this. It's somewhat, and, and actually, actually, models that change are quite important. One area of contact with neuroscience is the development of models, so it's understanding how our brains grow. And, and to do with developmental models, Anyone to change, change the problem that has been. Um, anyway, we, that's, that's in the to do list, but not in the top. This will take one more question here. Yeah, and then we'll take one or two more. I think my question is going to be that the current model in the current one, the leg table is working at one of the issues. There are, there are quite a lot of, of, of um, scalable models out there. So if you look at, I, I showed you a simple model of efficient system. Um, the performance of those models is actually currently constrained by how, how large you can sensibly make it of accessible computer. But there are models which you can easily um, scale up in, in the two dimensions by the order of magnitude. Um, and that will then start to use a lot of uh, 106 results. I don't know the precise numbers, but you know, the plan is one can run a single big model on the machine, or you can run a number of small models. We, we, certainly, we need to be able to support the second of those as well as the first. To what extent is Spinnaker unusual in the analytics point? Um, depends on what you're comparing. Uh, neural, neural models, obviously. It's fairly unusual in neural models. So most neural modeling systems are floating point. Um, or they're analog hardware. It's, it's, quite, it's quite an active analog electronics community floating point. Um, you can argue that they're, they're real, real numbers as opposed to. <laughs> <laughs> No, so, so working in integer is, is fairly unusual in this space. And, and as, as we discussed earlier, I mean, one of the downsides of working with fixed point is the programmers who aren't particularly good at fixed point tend to screw up a lot more. <laughs> um, because, because with fixed point, you've got to get the scaling right. Um, but we haven't automated the scaling at this stage, so we rely on programmers to do this sensibly. Because this is all down in, in the low level stuff. Um, it doesn't affect importing big networks and mapping them onto models. If the models arrive once, then we'll work with big networks as much as small ones. No, um, the real time stuff is, is all has to be quite small because 
over time constraints. Um, the biggest bits of software are the mapping tools, but, uh, which, which, which we're basically expecting to rewrite for every on the magnitude scale machine. The small machines we've had in the past, up to the thousand process machine. The computational problem is not too bad. But as the machine gets bigger, the problem of mapping problems onto it um, gets tougher. Um, quite rapidly. And our solution to this is we're going to do more of the problem on the machine itself. So I talked about projections which have statistical Gaussian distributions with certain connectivity. Those kinds of statistics can be expanded quite efficiently on the machine in a distributed way. At the moment we expand them all externally and then load resulting. Um, actually what costs us time is not doing the expansion, it's doing the loading. The 106 machine will have seven terabytes of memory. We're learning that at 100 megabit Ethernet link. <laughs> 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 If you look at the way, in the biology, if you look at the way spikes are propagated, um, they propagate along electrochemical wires when they're effectively regenerated by a continuous process that feeds energy in. Um, and, and so the hypothesis is that whatever you put in the beginning, what comes out at the end is pretty similar. Because it's, you know, it's, it's a nice bifurcating process that kind of always follows the same trajectory. Um, so most, most modelers assume that the spikes carry no information in varying amplitude or width, that they're pure asynchronous and um, Whether that captures everything is, is probably absurd. So we have, a, we, have, we have the option of putting play that If you want to qualify your spike, we can do it. Um, but at the moment, we don't use that. Except when I have one student who's doing that because um, there's a part of the brain that does acoustic direction finding. It's a bit of the brain which effectively measures the position of sound. So when, if, if you're in a room with your eyes shut in the dark, and the knowledge, you, can, you can hear where it comes from on the certain conditions. And you can think of that quite simply as you know, you've got two ears and the signal through the propagates across your head on side, and you work out where it coincides. That gives you a measure of Timing to each ear. Um, but the time difference between your two ears is less than a millisecond. And, and so you can, in fact, resolve that down to a temporal accuracy of the order of a few microseconds. Um, and, and how you build that kind of model is when it goes. We're currently playing with this. We can increase the time resolution. We can actually do the population coding, which I think is much more interesting. So we, we, we can represent microseconds. High resolution with millisecond time steps using the population code. Um, show that for you. <laughs> I think that's how long another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so you say that your project would also help us in terms of the potential of the future. I think that's going to come through communication improvements. I, no, no, I think at uh, the uh, sort of deepest level that that will operate at is, is that through understanding how the brain process and information, we will get ideas that may be built computers. Now, some of the things that I, that, that I sort of understand from spending a few years thinking about the brain are in the areas of what tolerance for instance. Um, I have some ideas as to how you build more robust computers on dubious technology, um, which is what is coming as we continue to shrink transistors. Yeah. And the carbon does go in this pieces. But these are quite radical ideas, okay? So, so the brain does not use binary representation. That, and it's quite important because with binary representation, you have a problem that not all bits are equal. But if you lose the most significant bit, it's much more serious than if you lose the least. Um, so the brain doesn't use that kind of representation because the most significant neuron is as likely to die as the least significant one. And, and uh, so it uses completely different 
data representations, um, of which we, we don't know the full story yet, but one obvious thing that's going on is population coding. So if you have a thousand neurons, and you think about how many ways you produce a hundred thousand thousand, you have almost the representation of capability of binary. <coughs> and you have some fault tolerance of all your ones that are created equally. If you add to that some sensitivity to the order of which they fire, then you've actually got better than binary representation of power. You've got for people represent more than two to the one thousand different symbols by firing a hundred out of a thousand neurons in a particular order. So, so you now, so that's fine. Um, and that may well be applicable in computer communications uh, soon. What I have no idea how to do is to have two numbers represented by that and work them together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how you do that. Um, but that's kind of what the brain is doing in some sense. Um, and, and in fact, if you want an insight into that, then the Chris of Icemates model um, actually does, doesn't use population coding. But does represent parameters by populations, and he computes connections that do addition. Um, so the, the spawn model is all done by pre-computing functions, which is mapping into the network. So further reading is needed. Oh, I, th I think further understanding. We don't we don't know how to use that this stuff yet, but there are there are ideas in there that the paint are that being formed. Um, you know, another another idea is this: that neurons send impulses. Okay. If they die, they don't send impulses. So they fail silently. It's much easier to build heritonal circuits that fail silent than conventional binary circuits which fail shouting. Okay. So you know conventional binary circuits fail with the notes that they're all on one. It's shouting that value. It's much harder to ignore a shouting failure than a quiet failure. So you know, again, we, we know how to build the electronic circuit to work inside the process, which should have that property. Which is a bit messy and a bit very much. Well, I think we'll probably agree with that. That was a complete revelation. Very, very well. So uh, let's thank Steve very much.